As we move through Galatians now, we want to ask the question, what is the purpose of the Christian life? Well, according to the Westminster Catechism, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. The Reformers believe that all of life should be lived solely deo gloria, to the glory of God alone. In the end, Christianity is not about being a better you. It's not about making a difference in the world. It's not about doing something great, nor is it about having a good marriage, raising good kids, or working hard at your job, or any of those things. That's not what the Christian life is all about. In the end, the goal of the Christian life is to glorify God. Now, all those other things may serve that end, but they are not an end unto themselves. All creation is meant for God's glory. According to Psalm 19, heaven and earth declare the glory of God. You go outside and look around and the creation is just screaming, look at the Creator. We see beautiful sights and we say, wow, that's amazing. When in truth, we should look at those things and say, wow, He is amazing. But humanity was also designed and built for God's glory. But then sin came into the world and death through sin... And sin is the glory stealer. It seeks to rob God of the glory that's due His name and give it to another. But God, through Jesus Christ, has rescued and redeemed a people for His own possession. And He gives them life through His cross. His blood covers their sins. His obedience satisfies God's righteous requirement. His sacrifice reconciles people to God. By His death, the curse is removed, and by His resurrection, the blessing of life is granted. And so the gospel, as we talk about gospel, the gospel is the news that Jesus Christ has come to earth, lived, died, and risen to bring this eternal life to those who would repent, confess their sins, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And so when a person is born again, when they pass from death to life, When they receive a new heart, they're saved, they're redeemed, they're regenerated. And God does this by making them a new creation. If you're in Christ, you are a new creation. The old that was you before has passed away. The Bible says, behold, new things have come. Your old self is gone and your new self has now been made and built to live for God. The deeds that you're going to do are not going to be to get you this new heart, this new life. No, your new heart, your new life is born out of what God has done in you. He is the one who affects this change. Titus 2.14 says that God is creating this people who are purified in Christ Jesus and thereby become zealous for good deeds. So the question is, well, You hear a verse like that, you say, devoted to deeds, is that it? And as we said in the introduction, that's not the end of it. That's not the end. However, Matthew 5, 16 talks about the fact that Jesus articulates the purpose, the purpose of Christian deeds. What is the purpose? He tells the disciples, he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Then he says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Then he says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Our lives are lived as salt and light in the world in order to point other people back to God that they might glorify Him. Our lives are mirrors of the divine glory that belongs to Him. And that brings us to the fundamental question that every single one of us needs to ask and ask often. Does my life bring glory to God? 
Now certainly intrinsically because you have been saved, because you have been prized in Christ Jesus. So of course, yes, God has glorified himself through saving you. But as you live, as you move, as you act and as you speak, do you do things that bring glory to God? Ask yourself this question. Don't forget this question. And further, I would even press a little deeper. Do other people give God glory because of your witness? Do other people who know you, do they see your life and see your deeds and say, your God is amazing? Is there a connection that's drawn there? That's a question that is asked of the Apostle Paul, and Scripture gives the answer. Turn to Galatians chapter 1. After visiting and ministering to the churches in the Gentile regions of Galatia, legalistic false teachers called Judaizers, they came in behind him, and they began to attack a couple things. They began to attack Paul's apostleship and his message. So an element of his ministry is character and the things he was saying. And they're claiming that Paul is essentially preaching a stripped-down version of the gospel. You're not giving him the whole thing, Paul. You're giving them part of the gospel, that's good, but hey, there's, there's something else here. That's their contention. That the true gospel, they would claim, should include the mosaic rite of circumcision. That has to be included. If you don't have that, then you can't be saved. That's what they were saying. And possibly even further elements of adherence to the law. Because once you start with circumcision, that opens the door for, well then, well, Sabbath keeping, right. You know, and, and then you know, dietary laws. You know, it, it just keeps on going. But that's where they're starting is circumcision. And so they're not just opposing Paul's gospel, they're challenging even his authority to preach that gospel. And while we don't know their exact contention, we don't know exactly where they're trying to, to get Paul, we get a pretty good idea of what they're saying based on Paul's response. We see how he answers their charge, and we can kind of paint the picture of what they're actually saying about him. Based on the argument in Galatians chapters 1 and 2... It seems to be that their contention is this. This is what they're saying. After Paul's converted, he goes to Jerusalem to be trained by the apostles. They gave him this message. They sent him out. But now, he's gone rogue. He's gone off the deep end. He's rejected the teaching of the apostles. And so, we are here on behalf of the apostles to correct his error. That's essentially their argument. Okay, do you see that? That seems to be what they're saying. But Paul responds to this by doing a couple things. First, in verses 3 through 5 of chapter 1, he declares the true essence of the gospel. He restates it. Just in case you forgot what the gospel is, I'm going to tell you what it is in verses 3 and 5. And then the second thing he does is he pronounces a curse on anybody who would preach a false gospel in verses 6 through 9. He says, if anyone, I don't care who it is, I don't even care if it's an angel from heaven. If they come to you and preach a different gospel, they're accursed. Not even kicked out of the church. They're actually destined for for ruin, for judgment, if they preach a different gospel. And then he goes and and establishes the origin of his gospel in verses 10 through 12. He says, look, my gospel didn't come from men. My gospel came from Jesus Christ. And now he begins to clarify the story. What is the story? Where did you come from, Paul? What was the situation? He wants to clarify his conversion, his calling, as well as a lot of his traveling activities. What he does in his early ministry matters because it affects the story. It affects his testimony because they're saying one thing and he has to straighten it out. He has to say another. Specifically surrounding his two trips to Jerusalem. And so, as we're going to see in chapter 2, which we're going to get to in a few weeks here, Paul asserts that he doesn't believe that these men that are coming down are actually true believers at all. He doesn't even think they're sent by James. They're claiming to have apostolic authority under, under James, who's the leader of the Jerusalem, uh, the Jerusalem Council, the Jerusalem Church. So they're claiming to have James as authority, but he says, I don't even think, they're, they're false brethren. They're not even Christians. And then starting in chapter 2, verse 11, he spends two and a half chapters of this letter dismantling the Judaistic gospel, the legalistic gospel. And we're going to spend some time doing that as well. 
on untangling and, and dismantling all these false elements of fake gospel. Instead, he proclaims that we are justified by faith alone, apart from works of the law. We're going to see that over and over again in this letter. But in chapter 1, which is where we are today, verses 13 through 24, Paul sort of gives his own spiritual autobiography. He goes through and tells his story. And and this is serving this purpose here. Number one, to establish the origin of his gospel. Where did I get my message from? Because that's the attack is on the message itself. Where did I get my message? And the second one is, well, answering some key questions about where did he get his apostleship? Where did he travel? What did he do? Did he actually come from Jerusalem with this message and now he's gone rogue? Or is his story something else? And so we're going to look at that. Galatians chapter 1. We're going to pick it up starting in verse 11. Paul writes, For I would have you know, brethren that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when God who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia, and I returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to be acquainted with Cephas and stay with him for... Fifteen days. But I did not see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But only they kept hearing, He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. Now last week we looked at verses 11 through 16. We really only dipped our toe in the water of the last part of that in regards to Paul's conversion and his sort of post-conversion experiences. But we noted that in establishing a chronology of Paul's life, it's a little bit more difficult than we would initially think. Now, certainly we have a lot of information about his life, but there are some events that are are missing in some accounts. There's overlapping information as well. It's not to say that constructing his life is impossible, but it does have some, some unique challenges to it, more details that need to be explained. But in short, the Apostle Paul is raised an Orthodox Jew, and he is training to be a rabbi. He has a zeal for Judaism that creates in him a sense of pride and even moral superiority. He's in Jerusalem, the very heart of Judaism. He's sitting at the feet of the greatest rabbi of his generation, and he is zealous to keep the law, thinking that that's going to build a righteousness for him that's going to be unsurpassed. And certainly he'll be one of the greatest faithful Jews in history. And so, in his zeal, he's determined to wipe out this movement that claims that a carpenter from Nazareth is now the long-awaited Messiah. That sounds crazy to him, as well as any other Orthodox Jew at the time. And certainly, that can't be. He can't have that. And so, Paul branches out. He persecutes the church. He goes as far as dragging off believers. He pulls them from their houses. Husbands and wives and children. He pulls them from their houses puts them in prison, and even consents to their death. That is until the Lord saves him. Keep your finger in Galatians and go over to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. I'm going to be working in Acts 9 and Galatians 1 back and forth, so just keep those ready to go. Acts 9 is most notably, we think of Acts 9 as the conversion and calling of Paul. And we looked at that a couple weeks ago. In Acts 9, the Lord, by miraculous intervention, he seizes hold of Paul in a way that you just can't ignore. I mean, if anybody experienced something like this, 
you just can't turn your eyes away from this, but there's something more that happens inside of him. The thing that happens inside of him is really what changes him. But look with me at Acts chapter 9. We know him as Paul, but he's also called Saul. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground... And though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. Now he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he said, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings And sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed, entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight and got up and was baptized, and he took food. And was strengthened. Now, for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. So, again, a dramatic conversion, something that anybody would have marveled at. But Paul says back in Galatians 1, he says, God has set me apart from the womb. He called me by his grace. He was pleased to do so. He revealed his son in me, the Son of God. And see, Paul is encountering Jesus externally, but also internally as well. This event in Acts 9, this is both. He sees something, he hears something, but something in him. It's almost like his his thorny heart of stone just cracks wide open, and God pulls it out and gives him a new heart, and he's born again. He has something new happening inside of him. Everything changes for Paul in that moment. But the question is, see, no one is questioning Paul's conversion per se, They're not saying, at least explicitly, that he's not a Christian. But the question is, did he get his gospel message from the apostles at Jerusalem? Because if he did, then you're in trouble. So if that's the case, if he's under their authority, then he has to submit to the delegates from Jerusalem. You see that? If he went rogue, then we're here to correct it. And so, if we can prove that he came from us, whether or not it's actually true, if we can prove in the eyes of the people that he came from us, then we're going to go and rein him in. So what's the story, Paul? What is it? Acts 9.20. Acts 9.20. Immediately, this is Paul now, he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying he is the Son of God. So, He's in Damascus after his conversion. He begins not, not to ravage the church. They were expecting that. I mean, he arrives in Damascus. The, the synagogues are expecting him to come in and lay down the law. We have this great, uh, this great persecutor that's coming, and he's going he's to wipe out this problem we have here in Damascus, all these Christians running around. He, he's going to come in. He's going to regulate. He arrives... He doesn't persecute the church. He begins preaching Jesus as the Christ. That's not supposed to happen. 
Why is Paul doing this? Because something changed from here to there. In fact, he becomes such a strong evangelist, he begins to throw Damascus into an uproar. Paul goes from new convert to evangelist almost overnight. I know some of you, when you first got saved, it's like you just get so zealous. You see the truth. You see it clearly. Not only has the weight been lifted from you, not only have I been saved and Jesus has, has reconciled me to God, now no longer am I right with God. I want to tell everybody. That zeal should not go away, I would hope. But you know what I'm talking about, that initial excitement that you feel. Your first love. The danger is that we can lose that first love, but that first love, Paul has that. And not only does he have the internal conversion, but he, he's heard the voice of God. And so he goes in and he begins to preach. But in Galatians 1.16, he says that after his conversion, he notes, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, flesh and blood people. However, we know, according to Acts, that he immediately goes and takes to the streets. But the comment, I believe, in Galatians 1.16 has to do with the fact that he doesn't go and submit himself to the authorities, to discipleship. He just goes out and starts to preach. So he doesn't, he doesn't go and consult anybody. He doesn't check with the local assembly. He doesn't go to, to the synagogue and try to make his case. He just shows up and begins to preach. And people start getting saved. Now in Galatians 1.17... He says that he does not go up to Jerusalem to those who are apostles before him, but instead he goes away to Arabia. He goes to Arabia. Where is Arabia? That's the question. Where, where is that? Arabia was the name in this time for the desert region surrounding uh, the area of Damascus, which is modern-day Syria. I know a lot of you, if you've seen Indiana Jones, the last one, well, not the last one, the last good one, Good grief. They keep on ruining trilogies. I'm just going to stop. Um, when he goes to that ancient city, and you see the carved out uh, uh, relief on the front, where he goes into this temple and there's all this stuff that happens, that, that's, a, that's a historical place. That's the city of Petra. That's in this Arabian region. That's where Paul went, is that, that region, that city, that, that area. It's known for its beautiful rock carvings, for its own ornate architecture. It was, it was strategically placed at the base of this ravine, which kind of protected it from outside enemies. So it was a city kind of hidden in this, uh, in this natural, uh, in natural canyon to keep it safe. In fact, Petra was the capital of the Nabataean kingdom, which Paul makes reference to in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But in Galatians 1.18... He tells him that three years later he comes out from that and then he goes to Jerusalem. But it's clear that for three years he's at least near traveling in Damascus or around Damascus and he's finding solitude in this region of Arabia. And the question comes up, well, what is he doing in Arabia for three years? Some say Paul's preaching the gospel, that he spends three years just traveling around preaching. And certainly we see him preaching in Acts 9.20 in Damascus. But it seems, and I'm, I believe this, it seems that when he says he did not consult with flesh and blood, it also may mean that when he went to Arabia, he went by himself. And that this three-year period was one of study and prayer and meditation. Paul went out to commune with the Lord. It seems fitting because the other apostles, we know the twelve, they had how many years with Jesus? Three. They spent three years with Jesus learning before they were sent out into ministry. And now Paul has this three-year period where he's away in Arabia spending time with the Lord. And that makes sense. Now, we can't be dogmatic about that. We don't really know exactly what he's doing. But it seems to make sense that that's what he's doing when he says he doesn't go out and consult with flesh and blood. Now, Acts chapter 9 does not record this three-year hiatus. If you look at your text, look. if you look at Acts 9, it's not here. We only see the phrase in verse 23. He says, when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted to do away with him altogether, but we don't see this event occurring. We don't see it anywhere. This has many scholars placing this three-year desert journey in, Acts, uh, in, in Galatians 1.17 
between the events of Acts 9.22 and 9.23. If you look at your Bible, 9.22 to 9.23. If there was a white space between those two verses, that's three years right there. And again, we note in verse 23 that after many days had elapsed, how many days might it have been? Well, possibly three years worth of days. So in and around this time, the tension is beginning to heat up. And somewhere along the line, Paul takes up preaching again. He comes back and he begins to preach even more forcefully. Look at verse uh, 923, Acts 9.23. Many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were also watching the gates day and night so they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. This would not be the last time, by the way, that Paul's life would be in danger, that he'd have to flee. But then we read in Galatians 1.18 that he says, After three years, I went up to Jerusalem. And Luke records this in Acts 9.26. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. So Paul gives his motive here. He says, I went up to Jerusalem because I wanted to be acquainted with Cephas. I wanted to, I wanted to go for a purpose. Who is Cephas? Cephas is the Aramaic name for Peter. He went because he wanted to go and spend time with Peter. And immediately the Judaizers would have jumped in and said, Aha, see, we told you. He was with Peter. One of the apostles, he's learning his gospel, he's getting it from the apostles, so therefore we're true. See, you did learn from the apostles. Except we read that Paul was only staying with them for 15 days. Is 15 days enough time to get all your training for ministry? To learn all your theology? Ask the men on Thursday night, is 15 days enough? No. No. You're just scratching the surface at that point. The Greek word rendered acquainted traditionally has to do with an interview or a meeting. He wanted to just go meet him and spend time with him. The purpose of the visit wasn't to receive instruction, but rather to get to know Peter and possibly, if he could, the other apostles, if they would allow it. Now, he's been gone for Jerusalem for three years at this point. Now, certainly the heat has died down, right? No, not at all. Acts 9.26, when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples. He shows up and says, hi guys, remember me, I've changed. But they were all afraid of him. Three years later, not believing that he was a disciple. He tries to make amends. He tries to come back. This is the first time he's been back to Jerusalem. He tries to repent and have fellowship with his new brothers and sisters in the Lord. He wants to join a new church. And they lock the door on him. They don't believe he's saved. Because they, I mean, think about it. If you're in their shoes, it would be very easy for this to be a trap of Saul of Tarsus to come and arrest and kill the Christians and they don't want to fall for it. After all, many in Jerusalem likely had friends and relatives who were imprisoned by the Apostle Paul. My my brother did time because of you. I was friends with Stephen. He was my deacon. And you killed him. See that? You see how there could be tension there? And so, no, they don't accept him. He says in Galatians 1.19, I did not see any of the other apostles except for James, the Lord's brother. Some have questions about who this James is, all the textual scholars. Well, I think James is James. Lord's brother, just like the Bible says. Certainly the half-brother of Christ. It's the pillar of the Jerusalem church. He's the writer of the the epistle that bears his name. But Paul doesn't enjoy fellowship with any of the other apostles. They don't see him. Now, it's possible that they just weren't in town. That's certainly possible. But he adds in Galatians 1.20, he says, Now what I'm writing to you, I assure you before God that I'm not lying. So he's certifying his testimony to the church in Galatia, in opposition to the Judaizers, he says, look, I didn't get my gospel from the apostles. That's not where this comes from. I didn't disciple under them. I didn't spend time with them. 
Why? Because they didn't even want to be around me. It's not just because I'm rebellious. I tried to go. The people wouldn't have me. So your case that I'm somehow going rogue and have my own man-centered gospel, it falls flat because ask anybody in Jerusalem if they accepted me in right off the bat and they would have told you no. Why do I want Saul here? He had to go. He had to leave. The only ones he saw were Peter and James and he only spent two weeks with Peter. But then something interesting happens. Barnabas, who we know to be Paul's later missionary traveling companion, he acts on his behalf. In Acts 9.27, it says, But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, he had talked to him, and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly, In the name of the Lord, and he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. Now, we don't know for sure, but this could have been how Paul was even able to get an audience with Peter and with James. Now, again, the other apostles weren't there or he didn't see them, but we know at least from here that it was most likely Barnabas who helped them get anywhere at all. So Paul's not doing this on his own merit. He was this powerful, erudite, upper-class religious Jew when he was in Judaism. He comes back, and he's nothing. He has no clout. He has no status. He's apostatized from Judaism. He has no friends. He has no hearing. They don't want to talk to him. They're afraid of him. They don't want to see him. He comes back with nothing and relies on his friend Barnabas to put in a good word for him. But again, his life is in danger. They're coming after him one more time. And so what does he do? Does he stay there and die? No. He leaves Jerusalem. That's what he says in Galatians 1.21. He says, Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. That's Paul's home region. He goes back home. At that point. In fact, Tarsus is the chief city in Cilicia. And he's going to stay in this region, in Syria and Cilicia. He's only been to Jerusalem once since his conversion. So one time in Jerusalem for a couple of weeks. That's it. He spends all the rest of his time ministering in Syria, in Cilicia, in Tarsus, in his area, until Barnabas is sent a couple years later to bring him back to Antioch in Acts chapter 11. We think that there is somewhere between 7 and 11 years of time in that general period. And again, the timelines, you can kind of play with those. But it's not just a matter of weeks or months. It's years. Years away from the nerve center of the church. Acts chapter 13, Barnabas and Saul are set apart by the Holy Spirit. And they're sent on their first missionary journey. And it's on this first missionary journey that Paul finds his way to Galatia. Now, Paul spent the better part of this decade in relative obscurity. He was not this rock star preacher, rock star evangelist, high power, high status, notable. He was obscure. He just went out and traveled just from city to city, just doing the work of ministry. And nobody even recognized him. They didn't even know him. He says in verse 22 in Galatians, I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which are in Christ. He says, they they didn't even know who I was or what I was doing. If I had gone to these churches, they wouldn't have recognized me at all. But he's still faithful. He's still laboring in obscurity. He's still diligent. He's still overwhelmed by the grace of God to save even him. He notes in 1 Timothy 1.12, he says, I'm thankful to Christ Jesus our Lord because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. You read that, you read the whole, the whole passage, it's like he's standing in awe saying, I can't believe that he would do this, but somehow he found me faithful and put me into ministry. I mean, he was happy to do it. He was so enthralled with the gospel. He was so just captivated by Christ. 
He wanted to do nothing else. But the fact that Jesus would even use him. I mean, frankly, he's the worst choice. He killed people in the church. He's going to go back and minister and and work as an apostle with authority to minister to people whose family members he hurt. People even in the Jerusalem assembly might have even been hurt by him. God, that's the worst choice. Don't pick that guy. But the ways of God are not our ways, are they? He does things very, very differently. God has a wisdom and a discernment and a plan that just surpasses human understanding. Why he calls some of us into ministry, I don't know. I don't know. Why he calls you to do what you do, we don't know. Why he saved even one of us. It's the plan of God. It's only by the grace of God that anyone is put into service. Anybody. But here, word begins to travel. Galatians 1.23, he says, But only they kept hearing, He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. How about that? This man was out to get us. And when he came, we, we didn't believe him. We thought he was still out to get us. But then we keep on hearing about all these churches springing up all over these Gentile regions. They're coming to faith in Christ. They're coming under persecution, but they're believing in Jesus. They're getting saved all through this man. Paul traveled around. He was, I mean, he was persuading people he had changed, but they wouldn't have otherwise believed him. Hence his first trip to, to Jerusalem. But remember that John the Baptist preached that we must bear the fruits in keeping with repentance. And the question always comes up, if you've changed, prove it. You can tell somebody, I'm sorry, I'm a different person, I've changed. At face value, if you love the person, you wanna, you're inclined to believe. You tell me you've changed, okay, I'll cautiously accept that. But what's the proof in the pudding, right? How, how do you know if you've really changed? If you go right back to the same stuff, you become cynical and skeptical, right? No, show me. Show me you've changed. Prove that you're a different person. Paul did. He did. He began to travel around, preach, minister, so much so that they, they stoned him and left him for dead. But here's the thing. Pagans were converted. Lives were changed. Whole cities were sent into an uproar. I mean, just read the book of Acts. You just see just the kingdom of God is advancing and advancing and advancing. Nothing can stop it. It's amazing. The evidence was clear that Jesus Christ was building his church through the efforts of the Apostle Paul. He's preaching the faith. The faith referencing the totality of Christian doctrine and practice. He's preaching the whole thing. He tells them in Acts 20, or uh, yeah, Acts 20, he's talking to the Ephesian church. He says, I did not shrink from declaring the whole counsel of God to you. I gave you everything I knew. Nothing was off the table. And when the churches in Judea heard that Paul had truly gone from persecutor to preacher, the Bible says they were glorifying God because of me. Notice the text doesn't say, and they thought well of me. It doesn't say, and they supported me. They thanked me for my faithful service. Good job, preacher. That's not what they did. No, they beheld this marvelous change in Paul. It was so evident because this man wanted to ruin them And now he's preaching to them with a zeal they've never seen before. They're changing. Churches are being planted. The gospel's going forward. We're going to see later on, he actually confronts his friend Peter for preaching, or at least believing and acting on a false version of the gospel. Paul is such a stalwart for the gospel of truth. It's undeniable. They see the change. They They can see the power of God in his life. And they have no choice but to praise God. 
There's no human reason why you're not the way you used to be. That's not normal. People don't go from that to this without something happening in them. God's ways are not our ways. And here's the thing. If he wants to build his church by using a zealous Jewish persecutor, he's going to do it. He builds his church using all the wrong people all the time. But God can use anybody. And I just pastorally, I want to tell you, I hear this, I experience this, I have conversations about this. I don't know what my gifting is. I don't know how God's going to use me. I don't know enough. I'm too young. I'm too old. My, ha- my, my history is too bad. If God can do this through Paul, there is plenty of hope for you. I don't care what your age is. I don't care what your capacity is. I don't care how long you've been saved, short or a long time. It doesn't matter. If you're in Christ, you are useful to the Master. God can do amazing things through you in your life and ministry, not because you're so great, but because He's so great. And He loves, God loves to take broken vessels, vessels that are otherwise useless to the rest of the world. He loves to take broken, useless vessels for all intents and purposes and do amazing things through them so that He gets glory. He loves to do it because the wisdom of God is foolishness to man. They don't get it. Paul says elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 1, there's not many wise, not many noble. We're not that great, people. I don't know any celebrities in this group. Nobody noble, nobody wise. We don't have the best theologians. We don't have the best anything, really. I'm not picking on you. But I'm saying that God loves to use people like you and me all the time. People who've been hurt, people who are damaged, people who have been wrestling with sins and addictions and heartbreak, people who are sick, people who are lowly, people who are depressed, people who have had a hard time, who've been poor, who've been impoverished, who've been talked down to for their entire life. God loves to use you and regenerate you, put a new heart in you and give you a work to do and you become zealous for good deeds. Nobody is beyond this, people. Nobody. God does not build superstars. He doesn't do it. We make people into stars, but they're, they're not. They're really not. He redeems sinners by His grace and mercy, and He gets glory. He saved you so that He would be glorified. Paul wasn't starting a denomination There were no Paulists out there? No. Contrasted with the Judaizers, Paul says in Galatians 6.12 that they want to make a good showing, a good, they want to report good numbers. They want to force people to be circumcised so that they can brag how many converts I got. They're bragging about your flesh, he says later in the letter. They don't care about you. They care about numbers. They care about the religion. They care about all that external stuff. They're just using you for their own ego. And let me tell you, it is all too tempting to build ministry that focuses on external things, numbers, results, notoriety, instead of faithfulness. God, let this be a ministry of faithfulness for you and for me. Not numbers. It doesn't matter how flashy this is, how big this gets. I don't care about the brand Not much brand here. (laughs) Just believers who are redeemed and saved by God's grace who want to be faithful to Him. If that's all Harvest Bible Church ever is, that's a win. For the glory of God to be faithful and to be nobodies for His sake. Count Zinzendorf famously told a group of missionaries, preach the gospel, die and be forgotten. That's great advice. How many missionaries do we remember their names? So few. So few. It's easy to build celebrities in flourishing cultures, but you go places where, where, where the culture is forgotten and the missionary is forgotten, we don't even know who they are. God knows. Their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life and He knows what they've done. He sees them. 
The end of all true ministry should be that God gets the glory. That he would be glorified. And Paul here, he puts no confidence in the flesh. He's got nothing. All of his status, everything he worked his entire life for is now gone. They hate him. He has nothing except the gospel. That's all he's got. Whereas the Judaizers wanted to enslave converts into bondage of the law, which only leads to boasting, Paul preached the grace of Christ, which leads to regeneration, humility, and worship. I want to close, actually, by looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, talking about this ministry that we have, the ministry of the apostles, their ministry, what this looks like. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In a climate when so many people are out for themselves, building their own empires, let me tell you, God will destroy the empires of man to build His kingdom. He'll do it every time. You, You see this all the time. Some big influential Christian leader, and they might do great things for God and be faithful. Their ministry gets to a zenith, and either something happens, either they die, or some scandal hits, or some calamity, or some catastrophe, and that all dissipates, and now it's gone. And all that's left is the gospel and the glory of God. He does it every time. He will do it every time. Ministries that were faithful for a season apostatize, and they become Liberal, they lose the message. But in a climate when so many people are building their own empires and it's tempting to build my empire, Paul tells the church of the ministry, the mystery, I should say, and the counterintuitiveness of their ministry. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame. Not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Then he says in verse 5, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. He says we don't preach ourselves. This isn't about having a personable, charismatic leader. It's not about telling jokes in the pulpit and telling you all my life experiences and building myself up as your leader. I detest the ideology of that because I believe Scripture does as well. We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus For your sake. Paul says, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He says, I'm not here for me. Beware of the leaders and the teachers who preach themselves and build themselves up for the sake of empires. Be very careful. The temptation exists for every single person to do it, though. We have to be vigilant and very careful. But Paul here had nothing to boast of, he had nothing. Nothing came from him. He didn't get his salvation from himself or from anyone else. He didn't get his message, his calling, his apostleship. In the face of the Judaizers who were claiming he was getting all this from other people, he says, no. This all came from one source. God saved me. God called me. He gave me a message. He made me apostle. I'm here preaching him. May that be our ministry as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's hard not to tremble when we think about all that is at stake. And God, I know that I I tremble 
to think about the danger of ministry that glorifies self. Ministry that builds up the person. The temptation is always there for us as believers to do good deeds so that we get glory and thanks and praise and so other people would see our good deeds and think that we are something great. God, that is always the sinful heart. And all of us have some measure of that sickness. That we want to do ministry for our purpose. But God, I pray that you would protect this church. Myself, the elders, anybody who's doing ministry, the members, the tenders, Lord, that you would put a bubble, an insulation, and protect us and shield us, Lord, from the dangers of self-seeking ministry. That, Lord, that people would see this ministry, that they would see our good works, they would see this church and not tell us how great we are, but rather to proclaim and declare how great you are. That, God, that they would see our good works and glorify you. God, I plead with you. I beg you on behalf of this fellowship that you would glorify yourself through this church. That you would keep this lampstand burning bright. That this would be a city on a hill. That we would not become tempted to be inward focused. But that you would glorify yourself. That that would be our chief end. Have mercy on us, O God. And help us to kindle afresh this fire, this zeal. To be a people that you're of your own position who are zealous for good deeds and zealous for the glory of God and zealous for the gospel. God, that you would implant that and stir that in us, Lord. May there be no greater calling. Thank you for your mercy and your love. We pray all this in the name of your Son. Amen.